Well, good morning. And last week we looked at Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. And if you remember that, that was where Paul the Apostle talked about the O oh man. Remember, O oh man, who are you who judges? And so what is what is he saying there? He's talking about the person who is uh, the anybody, who is the, the non-believer, who is the Gentile moral sinner. So we talked about that a little bit last week about how we live in a society similar to the Roman Christians. Remember, Paul wrote this to, to Romans, Roman Christians who were living in the capital of the empire. It would be like for us living in Washington, D.C. Or, you know, let's say Moscow in Russia or Paris in France. Some, some capital city of an empire, in fact. An empire that stretched all the way up to southern England. Remember, they never conquered Scotland nor did they conquer Ireland, the imperial Rome, nor did they conquer the interior of Europe from, like, let's say, Germany and Prussia, all those areas up to, to Finland and, and out into what we call today modern Russia. They never conquered that. They, were, they, they stuck along the coasts around the Mediterranean, the Middle East, and North Africa. And so the Roman Empire, as strong as it was, uh, it, as powerful as it was, it wasn't the only empire at the time. There was a Parthian Empire that was in between, between uh, Middle East and China. So what we call modern-day Persia, which would be Iran and Iraq and Pakistan and parts of Jordan and all that huge empire there that, that was a, more of a Middle Eastern kind of, the way we would think of it's like Ira Iranian. And there were many empires all over the world. I mean, think, think of the empires in the, in the Americas. The American Indians had huge empires like the Aztecs and the Incas and, the, and many of the Mayans, many of these huge empires. It was, the, it was the time of empires. But every one of those empires, interestingly enough, even though they were all pagan, they all had a sense of some sort of morality and justice some sort of sense of morality and justice. And so Paul focuses on that in Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. And he focuses, he, he makes like a laser beam focus on that Gentile moral sinner and, and says to them, oh, you are still without excuse. You are inexcusable, O oh man, whoever you are, who judges, and who is he judging? Who is that old man judging? The people in chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. That spiraling moral decline of society that gets worse and worse and harder and harder. Remember, those people were blatant sinners. They were getting worse and worse, pagan, and almost out of control and chaotic. And there were people and factions like that in society, in the Roman society. There were people like that in society in the Parthians in the Mayans, in all those big, huge cultures, there were some folks and big, rebellious and, and just lascivious and horrible sinners. So you had the moral sinner who would come along and say, oh, these people are really bad and they're really horrible. And so Paul comes along and says, but you, oh man, whoever you are who judges, do you do the same? You judge them, but then in a different way, in a different kind of way, you are sinning too before God. I mean, one of the biggest sins is that you aren't following God. You're not following the true and living God. So that's what Paul does in that chapter, uh, the first part of the chapter of chapter 2, we looked at. He's focusing on the Gentile moral sinner. But what he does shore up is this, the image of God. That all mankind, we have this commonality, of the image of God. And therefore, we all have this commonality of a moral justice, sense of fairness. Something is there. And that's what, what Paul is, is making a beeline for them. And so instead of trying to prove that God exists in that sense because they already have morality, there's already your proof. Why is there morality? 
Why, why would there be more? For the atheist, if we're just a bag of chemicals that just sprung out of the slime, why is there morality? Why do you have a sense of justice? Why even, I mean, why have anything? So that's what Paul does. He gets them and gets them right to the heart and focuses in on their conscience. Remember, he says their conscience either excusing them or accusing them that someday there will be a judgment of God. So he brings to those folks, there's going to be a judgment of God. To the folks in Romans 1, verses 18 through 32, he doesn't even have a chance to even dialogue with them. He's describing what's going on, you see. He's on the outside, not even letting them know because they won't listen. Now you have a group of people that he might be able to start dialoguing with the moral sinner that has some, some sense of morality. And that now today, this week, we're going to look at the Jewish moral sinner, the devout Jew, the Jewish sinner. And this would be a person who is devoutly religiously Jewish. So if we can have somebody read uh, verses 17 through 24 for us. Right here on the table. So. Yep. Or you can read up there if you can read it that far. <laughs> I can, but I'm going to look at my <laughs> Now, if you call yourself a Jew and rest in the law, boast in God, know his will, and approve the things that are superior, being instructed from the law. And if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the ignorant, a teacher of the immature, having full expression of knowledge and truth in the law, you then, who teach another, don't you teach yourself? You who preach, you must not steal. Do you steal? You who say you must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who detest idols, do you rob their temples? You who Boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? For, as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So who'd like to read the rest? Verses 25 through 29. <clears throat> For circumcision benefits you if you observe the law. But if you are a lawbreaker, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcision circumcised man keeps the law's requirements, will his uncircumcision not be counted as circumcision? A man who is physically uncircumcised but who fulfills the law will judge you who are a lawbreaker in spite of having a letter of the law and circumcision? For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, and true circumcision is not something visible in the flesh. On the contrary, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart, by the spirit, not the letter. That means that man's praise is not from men, but from God. Hmm. Okay, so Paul is now focusing on the Jewish person. So what is, what is true about this Jewish person that he's talking about? What is true about this Jewish person that Paul the Apostle now in Romans 2, verses 70 through 29 is focusing on? Paul in this section is completely focused on de the devoted religious Jewish person. It's very different from the person last week. I mean, even the person last week when we looked at the really focused on the Gentile moral center the moral sinner, but he's a Gentile. There are Jewish people who are, I would say, Jews in name only. They're culturally that way, but they're not religious. If you looked at them and everything they did throughout the week, and I mean, they don't even go to you know synagogue or anything. They just once a year, maybe go to Passover or something. And I, I work with some folks like that. And, they're, and they like the idea of having a Jewish ancestry and a culture and all that. They may even have ancestors or, you know, grandparents who were in the Holocaust and that kind of thing. And they think of their nation. But really, they're not 
they have a sense of morality, but really they're living like Gentiles in everything. I mean, they'll eat bacon. I mean, they, they just do everything. Like one, one of the guys I work with, he, he was telling me about something that his wife was cooking, and I said, oh, really? So how, how do you cook this? He says, oh, you got to add the bacon, though. The bacon is so good. I just love bacon. And, and, and you go, oh, wait a minute. This guy is not devout. He, is, he says, Andy, I keep telling you I'm not religious. And so you, that, could, that could be included last week. But this week, no. This is like the Pharisee. This is like the, the folks that Jesus dealt with. So we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, this person is one who holds to God's word as holy, holds to God's law as holy, and he does boast, and in fact, he should boast, because God wants him to boast in God as the only real living and true God. I mean, it's true. He is. So he does boast in the word of God. So that's true. So Paul is describing this person he's talking about. That could be could be a Sadducee, but mostly a Pharisee. It would be Paul the Apostle when he was outside of Christ. This devout Jewish person also believes. He believes and preaches God, preaches God and his word to the lost Gentiles. He looks at the Gentiles as lost Gentiles. He will want to proselytize them. He wants to convert them to Judaism. And Paul the Apostle was like that. And many others. Remember Jesus said you go over, over the ocean and go to all these foreign lands and try to make a convert to Judaism and you end up making them twice as much of the son of hell as yourself. And because they were trying to enter into the kingdom of God, but you diverted them and got them into this, which is Phariseeism, which is self-righteousness. But it's true. They will preach the word of God. They'll quote the word of God. And they believe that circumcision is a benefit from God and makes that person holy. So what Paul is doing is saying, here's this kind of person, but now let's analyze this person. Let's see if because this person does all of this, that person can make it into heaven on their own because of their own self-righteousness and works. That's really what he's saying. He's holding to certain things that from looking at the Old Testament, you would have to say, yes, this is everything correct. But there's something missing. The circumcision part is interesting, too, how Paul uses that. So what does Paul show? He shows that this Jewish person is not above God's law. And he might have broken God's various laws at least once in his life. And again, remember what I was saying, like, how many times, how many times does it take you to become a liar by you lying? Is it three times? I do three times and a bell rings and I know I'm a liar. Or are you a liar because you lie? Are you a person who is an adulterer because not only have you thought about this, but you've lusted after this woman in your heart? Jesus said if you lust after a woman, you look at her and lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart already. So there are all those passages that talk about that in the Old Testament and from Jesus' own teaching. So Jesus doesn't allow this Jew to be above the law. Remember Jesus saying, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will not see the kingdom of God. And, the, you know, the hearers are thinking, oh my, wait a minute, these righteous Pharisees, I know they're getting to heaven. You know, that's what they're thinking. They're going to get to heaven. And then Jesus comes along and says, they're not going to get to heaven. You have to have better righteousness. I mean, that's impossible. And that's what Jesus was focusing on. It's impossible to, on your own, be perfect from birth to death in your own power and to be fully in love with God and surrendered to him every moment of the day from birth until death perfectly. If you could do that, Paul is saying, then yeah. Who is the only person who ever did that? 
and they crucified him, Jesus. So it's like if you're the best guy in the world, you're going to be crucified. So you don't even make it to old age. You can't make it in this world because of, so there's so much sin. We, because of our old sinful flesh, hate that and want to kill that, and it's irrational. Sin is always irrational. It doesn't make sense. It's never logical, is it? So when Paul is addressing this sinner, he says that even among the nations, God's name is blasphemed. Who would like to look up Ezekiel 36, 16 through 24? Ezekiel 36, 16 through 24. You can also look up Isaiah 52, 5 on your own. You know, I, I put those references there, and then you can look at them. I put them on your notes there uh, that you're filling out. So this is the reference. What Paul is doing when he says the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles, he says it's written, but there's no place that that quote is exact. So what he's saying is it's written, and here's the summation of this teaching. So Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 16 through 24. So who'd like to read that out? Okay. Read it out loud. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own ways and deeds. To me their ways was like the uncleanliness of a woman in her customary impurity. Therefore I poured out my fury on them for the blood that they had shed on the land and for their idols with which they had defiled it. So I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed throughout the countries. I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. When they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, These are the people of the Lord, and yet they have gone out of his hand, or out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in, your, in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and bring you into your own land. Yeah, thank you. And that's what he's doing now, by the way. He's actually starting to bring them into their own land. That's a fulfillment now. But that's what he's saying here. That's what Paul is referencing. He's referencing Ezekiel 36, 16 through 24, and Isaiah 52, 5. He's referencing that because the Jews, when they were scattered out of the land, they have to remember, why am I scattered? Why am I in the diaspora? Why am I even here? They have to look back and say, wow, we as a whole nation, including myself, we are sinners. Even though I hold to God's law, even though I hold to everything that God says in his word, and they should, they are still sinners and there's something missing. They, Paul is referencing the big gap, gaping hole in their way of thinking. There's something missing. And then in 70 AD and onward, which Paul doesn't address, but he will address in a future aspect, and Jesus does very much address it, why are they being cast out of their nation and their temple being destroyed? The only reason in the past has always been because they rejected God's word and disobeyed him. And in this case, it's only because they rejected as a nation, legally, the Messiah. They rejected God's plan of salvation and they crucified the righteous one, the holy one, and rejected him. And so all of those things have to go, come into their thinking. When he, Paul is confronting them and saying, of all the people in the world, you were the chosen people of God. Start thinking, why are you scattered? 
because he's addressing these people who might be in Rome. What are they doing in Rome? Why aren't they in Israel? Why is Rome, the empire of Rome, over your people? Why is the Roman Empire in the land of Israel? All of those questions all should come back to Ezekiel chapter 36, where it's because you have profaned my name and you worshipped other things. And in this case, even though they were Pharisees, and even though they were religious, they weren't fully devoted to God. They may have been worshipping Judaism, you see? They may have been worshipping their religion and their traditions and their ancestors. And Rabbi Shlomo, who said so-and-so out of their Talmud, you follow? I mean, really, God is narrowing down into their heart. And then look at all the different secret sins you do. Have you robbed temples? Have you committed adultery? Have you stolen things? All of those kinds of things Paul brings back to the law and say, have you been perfect? If you haven't been, then a person who has broken the law in one thing has broken all the law. You're accountable to the whole law. And of all the people in the world, they should know this. And yet somehow they're resting in something else other than God. They're resting in something else other than God. And Paul mentions that in their resting in circumcision. Now, most Jews, when they are eight days, that is a male child, are circumcised by their parents. They are babies, eight days old. They had nothing volitionally, willfully, in obedience to God to do it. They received that because of heritage from, from their really godly parents or want to serve God kind of parents. So really, if they rested in circumcision, they're really saying, I'm really glad my parents circumcised me. If they're a convert from the Gentile nations and they come in, if you're a male person, uh, you are circumcised. And it's very painful for an adult, uh, you know, from whatever age on that you can feel pain. You know, eight years old, I'm sure you feel pain, but you're not going to remember it. You're a kid, you know, and they, you know, so it's a long story with this whole circumcision thing. But the normal thing was that they were all circumcised. A Gentile who is who is a friend of a Jewish person living in the land under Old Testament times, if that Gentile person wants to follow God and they're living in the land of Israel and want to celebrate Passover, God stipulates in the law that anybody who wants to celebrate Passover with you must do so, but they also must be circumcised. That's in the land while the temple's still up, while you know it's still under the um, Old Testament regime. So under the Mosaic Law, that you still have to do that. Today you don't have to because we're under New Covenant. So you can celebrate Passover with Gentiles who may or may not be circumcised. That's not the issue. But for a Jewish person to rest in circumcision is the worst thing to rest in because they had nothing to do with it. It wasn't something where they came to a place in their heart, in their life, where they did something. It's a sign of the nation, of a covenant relationship of a nation to God, but not a personal covenant relationship with God. And so where does that come into play? When you read Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 17, and the various other passages here, you'll see that God wants us to be circumcised in the heart. So in your notes that you have that I handed out, there's various scriptures there. So who would like to read the first one? Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 17. And the real focus is verse 16, but in the context, 12 through 17. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. 
Yet the Lord has set his affection on your forefathers and loved them, and he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Mm. So what did, what did God want them to do? He wanted them to love him and obey his commandment. But notice there's a word love in there. He says it a couple times. And love is related to the commands. That is, you need to have a circumcised heart first. Circum therefore, circumcise your heart. Circumcise your heart, therefore, so that you can love the Lord. So that you can obey him. Because I give you these commands for your good. Not just arbitrary. This is for you. This is for your good, but you won't know this unless you circumcise your heart. So Paul says that God's spirit is the one that circumcises your heart. If you look in Romans 2, the passage that we're in today, Romans 2, verse 29, it's the last verse. So 2.29, on the contrary, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart, by the spirit, not the letter. That man's praise is not from men, but from God. That person cares only about God's approval, God's praise, living for God. God is his life and purpose. And so therefore, that person has allowed God by his spirit to circumcise his heart. He has surrendered, submitted, repented. All of those concepts are in there. And in the New Testament, that's called being born again. So Paul is even saying that God really wants us to have our hearts circumcised. He really wants us to have a covenant relationship with him, a covenant relationship with him that is deep, not because of what our parents did, how our parents raised us, but personal covenant relationship with God. Personal covenant relationship with God. That's what he wants, a trusting covenant relationship with God. It's not something where, uh, well, I'm, I'm raised culturally and I love my parents and what they did for me, providing for me, and raising me this way. There has to come a place where we have a personal time with God, where God circumcises our heart to love him. And that is Old Testament concept. It wasn't just a New Testament concept. That was Old Testament concept. Jesus brought it to life in himself, in the fulfillment of being born again in Christ the real fulfillment of that. But there was something about that in the Old Testament where a person could have that covenant relationship with God in a personal way to love him, love God from the heart. And then it would be no problem for me to obey his commandments because he is my life. He is my reason for living. He is all my all. And I live only for him. I don't live for myself so that others will be pleased with me. I don't live for their approval. I don't live so they're happy with me. I don't live to fit in with them. I don't live, and that's the way of the world. The way of the world, their intimidation is to make you feel intimidated so that you'll go along with them. Whereas a person whose heart is circumcised, the world is crucified unto them and I to it. You know, we are crucified in Christ See, all those, all those picture words are in there. All those concepts and ideas of my heart is just cut away. The world is cut away. And all I have is a loving relationship with God. And that's what Paul's saying here. If you really want to be a Jew, if you really want to be a Jew, then you better circumcise your heart. So what is Paul doing with these guys? Well, first, let's go back. 
Let's go back. Let's think about what Paul has done so far. He has, you know, we all do this, don't we? We all pigeonhole people. We all put people in categories. From a biblical standpoint, Paul is doing that same thing. Paul is doing the same thing, and he's saying there's no wiggle room, boys and girls. There's no wiggle room. So here we go, chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. What do we have? Blatant sinners. Blatant sinners. These are the people who openly, sinfully are rebellious to God and his word. They are openly rejecting. Uh, They start out softly rejecting God and work all the way as you get to the end of that chapter, of uh, such blatant, horrible sins, hating God, despisers of those who do good. They are, they are wicked and, and they're blatant. So that's blatant sinners. Then you have the moral Gentile sinners. You have the moral Gentile sinners. And those are folks that have a sense of morality. But what does Paul say to them? You also are inexcusable. And then you have the devout religious Jew. Devout religious Jews. And what does Paul say to them? You too are without excuse. Have you stolen? Have you committed adultery? Have you bowed down to idols in your own life? You also are inexcusable. Wow. That's crazy. There's no wiggle room. Paul, wait a minute. You're crazy. Why? I mean, I'm, I'm a nice person. I, 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 at least I'm not going around robbing banks and murdering people. Come on, Paul, give me a break. Paul is not giving him a, anybody a break because Jesus didn't give us a break. He says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you can't see the kingdom of God. But how am I going to get this righteousness? I don't have it. Ba-da-da. Now your eyes are open and your heart is open. Maybe your heart is circumcised now and you see that you need to repent and receive the righteousness of Christ that he purchased on the cross for us. Amen? No wiggle room. Sinners can't hide. The judgment of God is coming. And in every case, Paul references God's judgment. He is explaining the gospel. He is explaining the gospel in minute detail. Unless the gospel is proclaimed also with judgment, explaining And warning sinners, there is coming judgment. We haven't fulfilled our job in telling folks of what the real gospel is, the real good news. Because unless they understand there is coming judgment, they will not flee to the cross. When the the fires of the lake of fire start coming and singeing the back of their bodies, they won't run to the cross and have rescue. The very idea of God's judgment should cause sinners to run to the cross. And if they don't, of course, they'll argue with it and make it as if it isn't real. But those whom the Lord is convicting by his Holy Spirit power, they will run to the cross. So we do ourselves a disservice if we truncate the gospel and just say that God loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. Yeah, that's true. He loves you, but what was that love? The cross. It was Jesus on the cross. Why? Because we're sinners and there's God's judgment coming. So for us who are Christians, this is where we rejoice. We didn't deserve this great love of God. We have something to rejoice about forever. That God has opened our eyes and pushed us to the cross by his love. Yes, it's the kindness of God. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. But the goodness of God is allowing our eyes open to see that God is real. God is creator. And God is also judge. He is a judge, jury, and executioner. He is going to bring judgment, and we are sinners. That is the goodness of God to let us understand this. It is the goodness of God to show us that now there is a Savior, a Rescuer, someone who has come to save us. That is the goodness of God. It's not the goodness of God to to, uh, allow us to stay in our sin, to allow us to stay in our fantasy, to allow us to be in this way of thinking of that we're okay, 
you're okay, I'm okay, everybody's okay. That's a horrible fantasy. When the coming judgment is coming, there is a day when God's judgment will come. And, and it's going to be like this. All of a sudden, they all say, peace, peace. And then sudden devastation will occur. And they won't know what hit them. So we need to warn folks. And we need to be praying for them, too. So isn't it something to rejoice about? We have everything to rejoice. We truly, we truly have a gracious and loving God. Oh, God, we pray that somehow, some way, you will use us. Use us, O oh Lord, who are imperfect people. Use us to bring those who don't know you to come to know you. In Jesus' name, amen.